Yesterday we concluded with some of the properties of the electromagnetic field coupled to the uh, charge hierarchy. And I described one example is from condensed matter physics where it comes in, like the uh, case of a superconductor. So today I want to go further and discuss what happens in the presence of a gauge field to the spontaneous symmetry. Then if you remember, originally we started with a system in which there is a symmetry breaking. Then we found that if you have a complex color field, then it produces a massless. Okay, this was called the Goldstone mode, and there is a massless with the operator. And then uh, at that time there was no gate field present. We want to study what happens if a gate field is thrown into the system. And something very interesting happened, which is what is related to all these Higgs particles which you keep there. So let me just try to introduce that. Okay, to do that, let us go back and uh, review briefly what we did without the gate field. Without the gate field, the system which we had was DL of phi, a complex scalar field, DL of phi star. Then we threw in a non-trivial potential here, which we took to be lambda by 4, one way of writing that potential was to take it as mod phi square minus a minimum value, which I call v square. We'll probably remember this. So this potential has the shape that if I think of phi having two degrees of freedom, phi 1 plus i phi 2, let us say, for the complex scalar case, <coughs> then we found that the potential has the shape, which is like this, which is rotated up. This is your uh, potential V of phi. Okay? Then all along here, this circuit, which is given by phi 1 square plus phi 2 square, which is mod phi square, equal to V square, where this potential just vanishes, you have a minimum, which is the ground state of the system. And we also found that in the ground state, if uh, if the field tries to move in this direction, there is, so to speak, there is a dragging the restoring force <coughs> due to the spring action here, with the minimum in this direction having a kind of an oscillatory behavior. While if it is rolling in this direction, there is no restoring force. And in quantum field theory, the restoring force is m square phi square. So this degree of freedom will be a massive degree of freedom. And this degree of freedom was massless degree. Okay, this is what we found. And the way we did that, we just went and assumed that this phi can be written as some rho of x exponential i theta of x. It is slightly more convenient to write it as theta of x upon v, which is just dimensional reason. In the last lecture, I think I just used theta of x. It doesn't make any difference, just a rescale. So v is just the minimum value of this. So when I put it like this, and you plug it back into this and work everything out in terms of rho and theta. The theta turns out to be a massless degree of freedom and rho turns out to be a massive degree. Okay, this is what we found. And that makes sense because theta is essentially what tells you going around in the circle and rho is the radial direction. So these are the two degrees of freedom. <coughs> okay. Now let us ask what happens to the same system if we have a gauge field process. So if there is a gate field, this Lagrangian first of all gets changed to a new Lagrangian in which this DLs are going, the partial L is going to be replaced by the gauge covariant derivative, DL of phi, DL of phi whole star. <coughs> the potential will goes for a right. By 4 mod phi square minus b square b whole square. Then you add to it the Lagrangian for the gate field, which is 1 quarter, and just write it as f square. You know what I mean, which is FLM, FLM. So you have got this system, and we want to know what happens. Something very remarkable happens. First, let us count the degrees of freedom here. Phi has two degrees of freedom. 
So there are two degrees of freedom in uh, phi. Then the vector potential AL also has two degrees of freedom, which we have studied. We have shown that the phi and the transverse degrees of the longitudinal degree of freedom can be set to zero. So it has only two degrees of freedom. So total we are talking about a system which has four degrees. Right? And they appear as a massless air, a gauge field which is massless, and then it has a scalar field which if I do this kind of a decomposition, assuming the same thing goes through, you would have expected to have one massless degree of freedom and one massive degree of freedom. But what happens because of the presence of a gauge field is that they recombine in a particular way. At least you can redefine the fields in such a way that the system is described by one massive vector field, okay, which has three degrees of freedom, and, uh, ma and another massive scalar field, which has one degree. The massless Goldstone moon, which appeared here because of this theta, can be completely eliminated. Okay, this is what I want. <coughs> so this is of great practical importance and also of theoretical importance. Because the entire success of salap weinberg model of the standard model of particle physics relies on this. So before I do the math, which is fairly straightforward, let me describe the overall context, which we won't go into in great detail. But at least you should have the picture. The idea is that when historically people looked at interactions, the great success of quantum field theory was in quantum electrodynamics. So in quantum electrodynamics, you have a vector field, which is AL, which is the electromagnetic field. And then you have the Dirac field describing the fermions. So you essentially study electrons and positrons, uh, or muons, etc., spin half particles interacting with a vector field. Now that field, we will, as we see later when we do the interacting quantum field theory, that field has certain divergences, which can all be taken care of by a procedure called renormalization. And this was a great success. And when people did this, they noticed that. The renormalizability was very closely tied to the fact that the photon is massless. That is, the gauge field which you are having is massless. Which was fine because the photon is massless and the electromagnetic field is a long range field. You know that uh, the mass of the field and the range of the interaction are related by some, the range of the, the effective potential of interaction, like you call potential, is given by e to the minus mx upon x. So the potential goes to 1 by x if m is equal to 0, and that is a long range field. While there is an exponential e to the minus mx if the field has a mass. Okay? <coughs> so the electromagnetic interactions were long range, and the photon was massless, and it was renormalizable, everything was fine. Then people wanted to describe uh, weak interactions, for example, which is a short range interaction by the same method. So if you want to describe the same thing by saying that the interactions are mediated by a vector field, you want the vector field to have a mass. Now if you start with a vector field, you can always give it mass because the vector field essentially has some kind of a kinetic energy term which is, uh, which is which comes from this S square term. And you can add to it a term which is M square AI AI. The moment you add M square AI AI, it breaks gauge invariance because it is, AI is not a gauge invariant okay? And you can say, let us not worry about gauge invariants and add a mass explicitly by it. If you do that, it turns out that such a theory is not renormalized. Okay? So there is a bit of a problem with that and people did not know how to proceed. So the idea is that you have to somehow give mass to the system, even though the fundamental fields you start with are not mass. And that is precisely what this one achieves. So if you start, in order to do that, you have to postulate the existence of a scalar field and the postulate the existence of spontaneous symmetry breaking. So once you have that spontaneous symmetry breaking in the presence of the gate field, the gate field can acquire a mass and everything will be fine. This is of the standard model. So let me try to do that mathematically. What we will do is it's fairly elementary. We know that the system has an invariant when phi goes to e to the minus i q alpha phi and al goes to al plus dl of alpha 
nothing changes in their brand, right? So anything which can be transformed by this cannot be a true physical degree. So what we do is that we look at this phi and we see that there is an i theta by b and we want to eliminate. That can be eliminated by choosing this to exactly match it. So what we want to do is to choose minus i q alpha to be equal to i theta by b. In other words, we will choose alpha to be minus theta over q. So this is the idea. You start with the system. It has these two degrees of freedom, rho and theta. Now you choose a gauge by making a gauge transformation where the gauge transformation function is taken to be theta upon q. I can choose it to be anything. I choose it with this. The moment I do that, your phi goes to just rho. Because that is the whole idea. This is chosen in order to kill this. So phi becomes real and it is just rho. And your AL becomes, AL goes to another field which we will call BL. Not a very imaginative naming. BL which is AL plus DL of alpha which is minus 1 upon QB. DL of theta. So you can think of it if you want as a field redefinition. You eliminate your rho, uh, you eliminate your theta, but instead of saying it is eliminated, you say that the theta and A is combined together to form a new field real. Okay? And you have the remaining degree of freedom stuck in rho. Alright? Now let us ask what the Lagrangian looks like in terms of these fields. So we want to look at this Lagrangian. So that Lagrangian is going to be, first we notice the fact that this derivative is gauge invariant, right? Therefore, after the gauge transformation, I could have written it down in terms of the new fields. So that will be DL, okay, let me explicitly write it down first. The DL of phi, which we originally had, because it is gauge invariant, it is going to be the uh, new DL in the sense that the new DL will be this partial derivative plus IQ instead of AL I have to use BL acting on the new phi which is over. The good thing about this is that now it becomes real. I mean real meaning real. both the parts of it is real. See, originally we had a phi here and a phi <coughs> here. So this part is complex, this part was also complex. Now that is not the case, this part is real, I times this, which is also. So it's a nice separation into real and imaginary. Therefore, life becomes easier. This is just mod square of dl phi. So that term just becomes dl of rho, dl of rho, square of the real part, plus square of the imaginary part, q square rho square bl b. This is what this is going in. Okay? So I want to make sure you understand that. You have a dl of phi. You made a gauge transformation where phi went into rho and the al went into al minus this quantity which is a new bl. Because this is a gauge invariant derivative of theta, the dl of phi which was originally there could have been written as the new dl times new phi. New dl is dl plus iq new al, new al is what we are called bl and the new phi is just rho. Okay? So this expression you have got and then you are supposed to compute it mode square. To compute the mode square you just make use of the fact that this part is real and then i times another part which is also real. So you just square this, square this and that. Okay? So that is the first part. Then you have minus one quarter f square, nothing changes there. Except that because fij is gauge invariant, whether I write it in terms of AL or whether I write it in terms of PL, it doesn't matter. 
So now I would have thought of f square as expressed entirely in terms of the b field. But it has the same algebraic uh, structure. So this is this. Then you have the potential, which is just uh, lambda by 4 mod phi square, which now becomes over square, minus v square. This is what we have. Okay. Now we want to go and play the old game because we wanted to shift the field to the minimum. This we did even before. I mean, when we wanted to study the mass for the rho in the original case itself, you assume rho and theta, and then we wanted to see what is the mass for the rho field. In order to do that, you shifted it to the minimum value. So we will again shift the field. So we are now going to assume that rho minus v is a new field. Uh, okay, let me put it this way. Rho was your field. So I introduce a new field psi as rho minus v. Okay, they shifted from that minimum value to p. So how does the thing look in terms of that? The Lagrangian will have dl of rho dl of rho that part is fine. Then let us look at this. So here I have plus BL, BL, Q square, and I want to write rho square, so rho is uh, psi plus V, that is probably better. Rho is psi plus V. Okay. So the rho square is going to be psi square plus V square <coughs> plus Q psi V. This is this term. Nothing need to be done with one quarter f square term. Then let us look at this. This is lambda by 4 into rho square minus v square. I write as rho minus v into rho plus v. Rho minus v is psi. Rho plus v is 2v plus psi. And I have to square both of them. So let us simplify this. This will be 4 v square plus psi square plus 4 v psi. Psi. This one. What is wrong with that? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that is the same as yeah. Absolutely. Okay, so everything is expressed in terms of psi and b. Okay, so now let us try to understand the physical content of this field. That is what we want. So this looks like a nice kinetic energy term for psi. And let us see whether there is a mass term for psi. So we need a psi square term for that, which is indeed here. So let us combine them together. So there is a dl of psi, dl of psi, then this gives me the mass term, so that is going to be minus lambda v square psi square. So I have taken care of this term. Okay. Then let us look at the B field. B field has a kinetic energy term hidden in this minus one quarter f square. And we are looking for a BL BL with a constant coefficient, which is there. There is a v square times this. So this is plus v square q square these two b l b l okay this is one so, yeah this is this is the remaining term for b l so I have taken this in the form and I have also taken this in the form everything else is interaction terms okay so I won't even bother to write it down I will say plus interaction term between dl and psi. So what are they? There is a some psi square b square kind of coupling. Then there is a psi b square kind of coupling. And here there is a psi 4 which was the original of this thing. Some people write, like to write this separately because this whole thing is just a potential for this u. So you could have written this with minus u of psi. And then there is a coupling term between 
Now you can immediately see that there are masses in the theory. So if I write the, if you rescale psi to psi over root 2, okay, then it, this will pick up a half because we usually write the Lagrangian canonically as half, some dl phi dl phi and then minus half m square. So you can rescale this also as something upon this and that will take care of it and this will appear as the mass. Similarly, for the B field, there is a mass. So your original gauge field has now become mass. Okay? Uh, you may worry about the sign of this, but you don't have to because you know that F square is like E square minus B square and E has capital A dot, the vector potentials dot. So the kinetic energy term there has correct sign. Now you have to look at the kinetic energy term for the spatial components of the gauge field. So when you take the spatial components of the gauge field in our notation, it will pick up a minus sign. <coughs> the BL, BL will be B0, B0 minus B dot B. And that B dot B is like A dot A. Okay? So the S square term will pick up a minus sign, so it has the correct sign for the mass. So you have, how did this happen? What the, the figurative way in which people will say is that your uh, gauge field has swallowed the Goldstone boson and has become massive. Eaten up the Goldstone boson and has become massive. And that massive field is, so there are, there are two massive fields here. And this is the vector field which is massive. And this entire procedure is called Higgs mechanism. It was recovered almost simultaneously by huge number of people, nearly six of them both in condensed matter and in field theory, but most of the time we call it the Higgs mechanism. And some and condensed matter probably we call it Anderson Higgs mechanism. So this is, this is the procedure by which the gauge theory picks up. But one thing I will notice is that your interaction terms are now very, very strongly constrained. See, there are different kinds of interactions which you have thrown in, which you would have never guessed. Suppose you had started with a massive vector field and a massive scalar field and try to write down some interaction. You would never think of writing down interaction terms in which the coefficients are all matched in a particular way, terms and signs and everything comes in. All that happens because you originally started with a theory which has this spontaneous symmetry breaking. Okay? So that is the main point. So you have this, uh, so just to summarize, in the absence of a gauge field, you have a massless mode here and much later on, when we have done the quantization of the scalar field, I will prove this in great generality. It's an extremely general statement that whenever there is some symmetry which is not respected by the ground state, there will be a massless mode in the theta. So in the absence of the gauge field, there will be a massless <coughs> mode which is the theta and that theta comes in the phase of phi and if you have a gauge field, you can eliminate that phase and introduce a new gauge field. And then when you do the shifting, almost by magic, you end up picking this term. This comes from the shifting. That gives mass to the gauge. Okay. So that is how you can have a situation where a gauge field which is mediating the interaction can become massive and in the process produce a short range coupling between the circuits. And this is what works in weak interactions and things like that. Okay. Now, in the process, you don't want to lose the number of degrees of freedom. If you start with certain number of degrees of freedom, that should remain. The peculiar thing there, which I have, I will not be able to prove in my course, but maybe uh, Gengel will prove in his group theory, may or may not. The point is that if you have a vector field, it is spin 1, and a spin 1 should have 3 degrees of freedom, right, to the plus 1, where j is equal to 1, so it will have 3 degrees of freedom. But it turns out that if the field is massless, then it always has two degrees of freedom. It has something to do with the fact that there is no rest prime and it comes from the Lorentz group structure if you do it properly. Okay? So the massless AL had two degrees of freedom and the complex scalar had two degrees of freedom. So the total was four degrees of freedom. They get transformed into a real vector field with mass which has three degrees of freedom and one real scalar field with mass which has one degree. So the four degrees of freedom gets redistributed in this. And you can have much more complicated symmetry breaking scenarios where the degrees of freedom still will be conserved and you can have an arrangement in which certain sector 
of the vector field in a more complicated group theoretical structure. You can have a system where certain part of the vector field still remains massless. So there will be some linear combinations. One linear combination will pick up the mass, the other linear combination will remain massless. This is roughly what happens in salam weinberg model because there will be different kinds of massive vector fields and you will have photon as a massless vector field remaining in the theory. Okay, fine. So that is all which I wanted to do as far as this is concerned. And in fact, we have now concluded classical field theory. So the next step which I want to take up is quantum field theory uh, in total. So we will start with this color. So the question now is the following. Suppose you are only yeah. Okay, there is something about this. So yeah. When you have a massive vector field, right. So uh, whether the components that are non-zero, I mean that you consider you've got a zero figure. Non-zero. Okay. Okay. So what I want to say is, in the massless case, I know that I can choose a gauge in which only the transverse components remain, and the other ones can. In be the free. massless case, that's okay. correct. So in this case, uh, is it that uh, even the logical component? Uh, no, no, it, uh, because if you write down the Proca equation, there is an extra constraint which comes in that. That is, if you write down the wave equation for a massive scalar field, a massive vector field, you find that there is an extra constraint which you have to use. A rough way of thinking about this is the following. As I said, this has, to do this properly, you have to study Lorentz group, which I am not going into. But a rough way of thinking about this is, suppose you have given a vector field, and you take the divergence of the vector field. The divergence of the vector field is a scalar. Now, when you make a coordinate transfer, Lorentz transformation, the vector field transforms into itself, but the divergence of the vector field transforms to itself. Okay, so it is not a completely irreducible context. So the divergence part you can always separate out and say that the true degrees, true vector degrees of freedom is only contained in the divergence field. Now I am talking about the four divergence. That is why. Roughly speaking, even though BL has 4 degrees of freedom, the divergence of BL can be thought of as a spin 0 representation. And the true spin 1 will have only 3 degrees. And so that is the reason why when you were talking exactly. about the master here, you were exactly. saying that the spatial part is what Just look at that. Because the other part is not going to contribute, it will go away. When you do everything properly. Okay, fine. Okay, so now we want to study quantum field theory proper. And there are, there are, I want to give you a conceptual background before we do it. First of all, as far as mathematics goes, we have already done it. If you are only interested in free quantum field theory, in the sense that the quantum field theory whose excitations are going to be free particle, we have already done it because we wrote down the propagator for a free particle. Then we represented it in terms of a field. I explained to you why the fields are hidden inside the propagator and how the fields can be written in terms of commutators how they decompose into harmonic oscillator, everything has been done. So, in the next couple of lectures, I am only going to give you the connections, so that you understand it from both points of view, either from propagator to the field, or from field to the propagator. But interacting field theory is a completely different kettle of fish, because interacting field theory is something which represents particles which are going to interact with each other, and uh, that is much nicer to do, much more effective to do, using field theory rather than using propagators. Okay, so that is a point which you have to remember. So if you are only going to do free field, which is what we are going to do for some amount of time, there isn't much to be gained by the language of field theory. However, if you approach the entire problem from the language of field theory, several new effects come up. That is, now we are thinking of field as a physical reality and we are going to quantize it. You start with a classical field, and then you are saying that I am going to condense it and see what I get. There is one very key example which we have where this has to be done. You may think that it is a matter of choice whether I am going to look at the... First of all, interacting field as it is a separate issue. But let us just look at free particles. Suppose I have a free relativistic particle. The way I have approached the problem, you might think that a free relativistic particle either can be thought entirely in terms of propagation or in terms of harmonic oscillators and the field and depending on the day of the week you can choose either one of them and there is no problem. This is not true. This is not true because there is at least one field, namely electromagnetic field, which exists as a classical field. So here is a classical system which you should be able to quantize. Now in the early days of quantum mechanics when things were developing, 
people had this debate as to whether electromagnetic field need to be quantized at all. I mean, people knew that particles has to obey quantum mechanics. I mean, there was Schrodinger picture of the standard, you know, hydrogen atom and stuff like that. So if you have an electron, you should have some kind of a wave function associated with it, etc. But the question is, do we have to do this to the fields? Okay. Now, fortunately, you had experimental evidence. I mean, experiments showed that electromagnetic field behaved as though it is made of quanta, which you call photons, and there were all kinds of experiments which showed that that is the correct description. So you needed to quantize it and develop it. But even theoretically, you can think about this. The point is that if you have a system, a quantum system which is coupled to a classical system, that almost by definition is inconsistent. I mean, it is inconsistent in the sense of thought experiment. So, one of the simplest thought experiments you can perform is that suppose you have a, you have some spring or we are talking about quantum mechanics here. There is a potential well like this, and you put a charge particle in, it, and the charge particle is oscillating. Okay. Classically, a charge particle which is oscillating here will radiate. But let us not worry about radiation for the moment. Let us just assume that because of this. If you think of it as a quantum mechanical system and you put it exactly at the origin. See, classically, if it is oscillating, it will radiate. And we don't want to worry about radiation. So we want to put it at the minimum. Then classically, you are done. There is a charge which is staying quietly. So it will just produce a Coulomb field around it. It will not even produce a magnetic field. But quantum mechanically, if you look at the same thing, it is not at the, it is at the ground state with some energy. And at that ground state, it has a delta x and a delta p. And you are told that delta x, delta p has to be greater than uh, some minimum value. In other words, you should not be able to measure its position and momentum simultaneously with greater than some accuracy. Right? Fine. Now, what I do is I use the fact that this is a charge particle. Then I go far away, just this point. And I measure the electric and magnetic fields produced by this I can do. Assume for a minute that electric and magnetic fields are not do not obey quantum condition. They are classical. That is electromagnetic field, you don't have to quantize. You only have to quantize particle mechanics. If that is the case, the moment I have measured the electric and magnetic field here, I can work backwards and figure out its position and momentum. Because the momentum is like velocity, velocity it plays a role in the magnetic. So you can in fact you don't even have to take such a sophisticated thing, take any particle which is moving and you calculate what is its electric and magnetic field, you can work backwards and calculate the, you can violate the uncertainty principle. If electric and magnetic fields are measurable to arbitrary accuracy, but the position and velocity of the source is not measurable to arbitrary Therefore, E and B has to satisfy at least some kind of an uncertainty relation, which the nicest way to do this is to elevate E and B to operator status and uh, give some <coughs> commutation. And since E and B comes from the vector and scalar potential, you have to work with it. So we are assuming that the moment one field has to be quantized, all fields has to be quantized and with this kind of a thought experiment. And the reason for this is that uh, the same debate goes on with gravity. Every once in a while somebody will say, should gravity be quantized at all? Gravity is the curvature of space time. And why do you want to quantize the curvature of space time? Maybe all the quantum fields will interact with gravity, but gravity will remain unquantized. It just doesn't work. I mean, you can construct similar thought experiments in the case of gravity to show that if the source, suppose electromagnetic field can produce a gravitational field and electromagnetic field is quantized, then the gravitational field has to be quantized. Okay. So that is why I wanted to spend some time describing this. But at least in the case of electromagnetism, we have experimental evidence. Now, electromagnetism, unfortunately, comes with this uh, extra baggage of gauge energy. As a result of it, quantizing an electromagnetic field is not very easy. So we will start with simpler structures like a scalar field and study them. Oh, so let us start with a scalar field. You are given our favorite Lagrangian, which is L half DL of phi, <coughs> DL of phi. So now I am talking about a real scalar field. This is a bad choice for some reason, but I am assuming you guys are now educated enough to understand the securities. So this is the field which we have. So here phi is a C number and you want to quantize this system. So how do you quantize this system? 
In this particular case, it turns out to be enormously simple. What you do is you go to the action. You first write this file in a Fourier space, which will be integral d3k over two pi d whole cube in our notation. Then you introduce a field qk, which depends on t, e to the i k dot. See, the idea is that we know how to quantize a quantum mechanical system and we are hit with the field theoretic system. So we reduce it to something which we know. If I plug this into this Lagrangian or better still to the action, this we have done uh, before, the action for the field, which would have been integral over d4x of this Lagrangian, will now become integral over d3k upon 2 pi equals q integral over dt half qk dot modulus square minus omega k square qk where this omega k square stands for k square plus <coughs> As I said, we have done this before, so I am not repeating it. So you should go back to your notes. The way it is done is that you take this, take an integral over d3x, plug this back. Okay? So there is a phi dot square. That phi dot square will give you a qk dot square. And then when you square and integrate over d3x, everything will take care of because of the Dirac alpha function and it will be just partial scalar in uh, momentum space. And there is a gradient of phi square that will give you a k square phi qk square. Then there is an m square phi square that will give you this omega. Okay. So what we have done is to decompose this into a bunch of harmonicas. And here also uh, there is one point which I had already mentioned but just to remind you, even when phi is real, if phi is complex, obviously this q will be complex. If Even when phi is real, if you look at phi star and you say that phi star should be equal to phi in the classical level or phi dagger should be equal to phi as an operator, this will imply that q star of k should be equal to q of minus g. Okay? This makes qk cannot be real. The way you have decomposed this, if phi is real, qk cannot be real. So qk is a complex field. But that does not matter to us because you see that in the Lagrangian itself, it is only the mod square which uh, comes in. So if you write your qk as uh, some xk plus ioyk, where both of them are real, then you will get xk square and a yk square here. So it just doubled up the total number of oscillators. Okay? But on the other hand, there is this condition which halves the total number of oscillators. That is, if I know what is the qk, I can fix what is q of minus k by just flipping it. So if I write it as xk plus iyk, then x of minus k should be equal to x of k, y of minus k should be equal to minus y of k. So only half the k values are independent when you deal with x and y. But x and y has twice as many degrees of freedom as phi or q, q. And then you put this condition and you reduce it back the same number of degrees. So if you are a purist, you should do all this properly. I am not a purist, so I will just assume that things will work out and think of this q. Whenever I write qk hereafter, I mean xk and yk. Okay? So they are like a, you need this because when you convert this into an oscillator and you try to quantize the oscillator, the Q of the oscillators are supposed to be Hermitian operator. So classically they should be real, but this Q is not real and that is why you have to do all this. So how do you quantize the system? Very elementary, you just quantize every harmonic oscillator. That's all. So the problem is solved. For free fields, you just identify your harmonic oscillator solve each of the harmonic oscillator. We know the solutions of the harmonic oscillator. 
what is the state of the Hilbert space? I mean, what are the states in the Hilbert space which you want to deal with? You take a state which is described by a set of numbers n p. This is the most generic energy eigenstate which you have. So you take each oscillator, attach an uh, integer to it. The a generic state of the uh, system is described by saying what is the excitation level of each of the oscillators. Now if you compute the energy of the state, and for the moment you ignore the zero point energy because the the, even when all the ends are zero, you are at the ground state and that will have half x plus omega for each state. You will come back and spend a lot of time with it. But for the moment, if you ignore that, then the energy of this will be just nk, which is the number of particles in state k. I can interpret it like that, times h cross omega k, which is the energy in that state, integrated over d3k over 2 by the code. This will be the energy of this state, except for the zero point energy. So you have energy eigenstage and this description very naturally suggests interpreting this state as made of nk particles with momentum k and energy give, uh, related to momentum by this distance. This is at the base of quantum field theory success. In fact, most of the condensed matter physics excitation, like phonons, they say anything will happen. All that will change is this dispersion ratio because there will be a much more complicated lattice vibrations which you are quantizing, so the dispersion ratio can change. It might have a different form. But you can think of it as an excitation of a base field, and the excitations carry a certain amount of energy and momentum labeled by k and omega k and the states are labeled by integers. You act on it with a a dagger corresponding to the kth momentum vector, you reduce nk by nk minus 1. Similarly, you act on it with a ak, you will increase nk by nk plus 1. So, as I said, actually it is a triviality because you have done everything and uh, you know all these things and it is just a question of having more labels and uh, integrals over variables, etc. Free field, once you have identified the harmonic oscillator, there is nothing more to it. You just contain the harmonic oscillator, everything you know about harmonic oscillator works. Okay. <coughs> now let us come to the non-trivialities. The first non-triviality is that should we use Heisenberg picture or Schrodinger picture or something else to study this system. This may look like a technical question, but it is going to play a huge role in what we are going to do. So I want to spend a little bit of time. If you are given a harmonic oscillator, most of the time you solve that in quantum mechanics using Schrodinger picture. You write down the Schrodinger equation for it, you identify the energy eigenfunctions and you work with it. Okay? What will happen here? So let us try to understand that. If you work at the level of QK, nothing changes. What you do is that you quantize each of these QKs and you write down a wave function psi for the kth oscillator, which is a functional of QK. I mean, the cautionary note is that this QK should be real. So I am assuming when I say QK, there is you guys have done some XK and YK separation. I will continue to use QK as though it is real, but it is not real. So, but that doesn't matter. So, this is the wave function for the kth oscillator. Now, if you take the product wave function, <coughs> you go from this to pi over k, the wave function for each one of them. You have the full system. Alright. You have the entire system described in terms of q space. But the question is, how do you describe this in the real space? Okay. Now, here there is a problem. Eh? A real space in the sense of uh, phi of x. Okay. Instead of qk, I want to describe everything in terms of phi of x. So for that, you need to think a little bit about what is going on in quantum mechanics in Schrodinger phase. In Schrodinger, so you classically you started with a degree of freedom q, which was a function of t. 
Think of a hydrogen atom or a particle, free particle, harmonic oscillator, any of them. You had a degree of freedom Q of t. Then you went from that Q of t to a wave function, which was psi of t comma q. This independent variable t went into this independent variable. And instead of dealing with any Q of t trajectories, etc., you started a probabilistic interpretation, which is like this. What happens here is the following. The dynamical degrees of freedom for your system is phi of t comma x. Right? You describe the state of the system by saying at a given time t, the field has a particular configuration phi of x. You fix your t and you say what the field is. Just as at a given time t, you give a position. But now you have to give me a function rather than a number. In this particular case, you just gave me a number at every time t. Here you will give me a function at uh, every time t. Therefore, the quantum field theoretic description will be like this. Make it a capital psi t comma phi of x. It is this independent variable goes for a ride both in quantum mechanics and in quantum field theory. The dependent variable was a pure number you put it here. Here I had taken the t and put it there. What was left is a phi comma x, omit the comma, phi of x you put it there and put the comma outside. Okay? So this is what you have done. So what does it mean? What does this tell you? What does this tell you? If I take the mode square of this, it will tell you what is the probability to find a particle at a point Q at time T with some small interval DQ etc. with a measure. Okay. Here if I take a mod square, it will give you the probability that at a time T the field configuration is described by phi of x. Suppose I say that I go and make a measurement, I mean here if I make a measurement on the position of the particle, the probability that I will find the particle to be at 3.5 cm from the origin is given by mod psi square with q replaced by 3.5. Here what is going to happen is that suppose I make a measurement of the field everywhere in the space and I want the field to be described by exponential minus tan h of mod x square. I find that the field is fitted with this function. What is the probability for that? Then the, you take this mod square and plug in here that function and you will get a number. Okay? So everything which was there in terms of one variable has become in terms of the function. But that is where all the problem starts. Suppose you want to write down the Schrodinger equation. The Schrodinger equation in the first case would have been i d psi by dt. When I say problem starts, uh, mathematical problem starts. If I am talking about free particle, I would have got minus d square psi by dq <coughs> right? What should be the corresponding thing here? As far as time is concerned, it goes for a y. So you can write i d psi by dq equals, maybe there is a minus and maybe there is a half. Then you want to replace d square by dq square by something. So Q is the variable here, which appeared here, so you could take a derivative. Here what appears is phi, so you have to take a functional derivative. So the equation will become del square psi with respect to d square phi. So these are functional differential equations and they are notoriously difficult to solve. And there are also issues related to measure. For example, you say, uh, even in quantum mechanics, when you take mod psi square, and you want to know what is the probability for it to be between Q and Q plus DQ, you better be careful with the measure. You don't use the same measure in R and R plus DR. You will put R square DR. The volume element in this space is needed. Like if I have a Q1, Q2, Q3, <coughs> Q1, Q2, Q3 or XY is there. Then dx dy dz would be the measure in the Cartesian coordinate, but it will be r square sin theta d theta d phi dr in the uh, spherical polar coordinate. Now you want to know what is the measure in the space of functions. 
is non trivial okay so this procedure runs into major uh, mathematical and technical problem just to give you a feel for you i will do this for the ground state and then that is all which i will do and after that i will stop for the ground uh, in uh, pursuing this schrodinger picture okay there is one more problem with this our entire theory was based on the concept of lorentz invariance so we want to in some sense treat space and time together okay therefore an approach like this already is a negative backward step here we have the fourier transform with respect to space leaving the time alone and everything which follows from there sort of breaks the manifest lorentz invariant of course we know the theory is fully lorentz invariant and it will be recovered in the end and all that sort of a thing but in the intermediate steps it breaks the lorentz so it is better not to work with a formalism which all the while does that but at least to have a easy way of going back and forth between space and time treated in a unified manner to space and time treated separately this works much better in heisenberg picture as you will see because heisenberg picture is what we are going to do so i am not uh, describing that now but you will find that it does work not completely even in heisenberg picture very often for calculational convenience we will break it into space and time which you always need to do but it is a lot closer to the philosophy of uh, uh, relativistic invariant than schrodinger okay. the next point is that the moment the schrodinger picture goes for a toss you also throw out of the window the standard path integral method and this requires a little bit of explanation we are going to use path integrals extensively when we study interacting fields and we had already used this when we studied uh, the sources and how sources produce vacuum persistence and all in all of them the path integral will be used as a tool as a generating function remember when we did the vacuum to vacuum amplitude in the presence of a source we did a functional fourier transform to get the fields so there we were using path integrals all the time and functional fourier transforms and stuff like that but they were not like the standard feynman propagator and the curve so let me explain the difference in showing a picture we have this idea that you want to look at k uh, x2 okay, let me okay so i go back to our previous notation x2 x1 this is a four dimensional variable t2 and uh, x x2 y2 is a 2 similarly t1 x1 y1 is a 1 for that this we could write as a path integral or sum over paths of d of x we are talking about quantum mechanics so the sum over is of the paths x of t of exponential i times integral l d or better still let me write this as action so the action was defined in the sum as something which has the boundary conditions x2 and x1 and is a functional of the path x of t let me remind you again what is going on here you take the action for any path which is connecting x1 t1 to x2 t2 and that path is denoted by this then you compute the action for that keeping the boundary condition fixed then you sum over all these x of t what is left will be just a function of x2 and x1 and that is what we call the kernel like for a free particle this was x2 minus x1 the whole square or t2 minus t1 and an m by 2 etc okay suppose we want to translate this into field theory what would you expect well we do know the action for the field i mean that is what we started with that looks very nice now you can evaluate this action the action obtained by integrating this lagrangian saying that at t is equal to t1 the field had a particular field configuration phi1 and at t is equal to t2 it has another field configuration phi2 so what you will end up getting is a similar quantity let me call it g 
phi 2 of x at time t2 starting from the configuration phi 1 of x at time t1 this is exact parallel with this that would probably become so easier to understand if I expand this as well. What I have here is P2 X2 semicolon P1 X2. So here we are talking about a particle which was at X1 at time T1 going to a position X2 at time T2 and what is the amplitude for that? In the case of a field we will say that the field has a configuration. It was described by a function phi 1 of x at time t1. And it was described by another function phi 2 of x at time t2. What is the amplitude? That amplitude is sacred. It is given by a path integral. It is given by an integral over all function phi, which satisfies this boundary condition, just as you choose paths which satisfy this boundary condition times exponential i times now it is an integral over d4x of the Lagrangian which is written okay so in principle this works and what it tells you in combination with this is that just as in quantum mechanics you can multiply this by a wave function at x1 integrate over x1 to get the wave function at x2 I could have done a wave functional at T2, the wave functional of the system at T2 in terms of a field configuration phi 2 of x would have been given by you take the kernel, this one, T2 phi 2 of x. T1 phi 1 of x. Multiply the functional at the initial time, which is psi of T1 phi 1 of x. And normally, in this particular case, I would have multiplied it by this wave function and integrated over this coordinate q. Here my coordinate is replaced by this uh, phi, so I have to do a functional integral over d phi. So the analogy is perfect, but calculation is a pain. Okay, so uh, I mean you need to worry about what is the wave functional and then how do you do this functional integral, etc., etc. Except in the case where it can be decomposed into harmonic oscillator, when you don't need any of this. It is such a simple system. When of course I can again decompose all of them in individual harmonic oscillators and you can write down the kernel for a single harmonic oscillator and then multiply the wave function it will take care of it. So if you are really going to study anything non-trivial like an interacting system etc etc this is not going to be of great use. However, some of the formal techniques which we developed like going to the Euclidean time, taking the uh, infinite time limit in the Euclidean time to get the ground state etc. None of them dependent on whether you are working with a single particle or with a field configuration. So all those tricks can be used and that can be a very powerful uh, technology. Okay, that we will we will mention it when it comes out. In fact, at least one case of uh, the vacuum state looking like a thermal state in another frame, I will try to do this in a very cute way, just using these functional integral techniques. I mean, it doesn't require any of the paraphernalia which you need in other methods. So it can be a very powerful technique, but its use is limited to very specific kind of problems. Okay, fine. So having said that, I want to give you one non-trivial example of this wave function, and then we will proceed. Yeah. So these remarks are really for saying that okay, we won't work in field representation, right? I mean, rather yeah. saying that Schrodinger has not worked. No, we won't work in Schrodinger representation. This is the Schrodinger representation. There is no other Schrodinger representation in field theory. No, I am just saying that for example in quantum mechanics you have I mean, evolution according to Schrodinger or you could work in the position representation or momentum or No, that is a separate issue. <coughs> right. so I am not talking about position representation or momentum representation. I could have done this entire thing in momentum representation. 
I would have run into the same problem. You see, because for a harmonic oscillator, position and momentum representation are equal. And all the fields are going to be like harmonic oscillator. If you look at the Hamiltonian, it will have a pi square term, there will be a del phi term and a m square phi square term. So you go to the momentum representation, you make the this part easy, right, so to speak. But this is because I just wrote down this term. This is not a full story because the Hamiltonian will have other terms. I just wrote down this term to illustrate this del square. There will be, for example, an m square phi square term. And that m square phi square term will pick up del square, the functional derivative with respect to the moment. Right, so again, that will be... It will again be a functional differential equation. So whether in Schrodinger picture, whether you use momentum representation or the position representation, in field theory you gain nothing. So the entire Schrodinger picture has to be scratched. Okay. So the, the, the easiest way to think about this is again to go back to the harmonic oscillator. If you are working with a free particle or with a linear potential, the momentum and position representations are different. It can be characteristically different. For example, if it is a linear potential, that is one case where momentum representation is simpler than the position representation. But in general, when you are looking at uh, harmonic oscillator kind of thing, which is what this will boil down to, the position and momentum representation are equivalent in the sense that technically, in one case you will need d square by dq square, in the other case you need d square by dq square. So the idea is just that. Okay. So let me now uh, try to do this. Just for the ground state wave function, because it is conceptually important and it also illustrates some point. So what we want to do is that, is there anything in the field which you could not have obtained from your particle field, in free field, okay, interaction as I said we are not even touching it. It turns out there is one and it finally appeared as something called Casimir effect in electromagnetic field which we will spend time on. But I want to sort of uh, tune you towards that. So if the field is what you are going to work with, I told you that when you take this state and you look at the ground state where there are no particles, it still has an energy. We had already seen evidence for this in terms of the closed loops when you this the particle propagate, right? So there is something peculiar going on there and let us see, now that we have got a field and we are condensing the field, let us ask what it is, okay? So the way it works is the following. We have written down here how to write down an arbitrary wave function. Let us assume for a minute that all the uh, oscillators labeled by every k is in the ground state. What is the wave function for? So let us write it down. So you, what you want to do is to compute the ground state wave function. So I will call this psi ground state. This is obtained by taking the product of all the ground state wave functions of the oscillators. So the oscillator ground state wave functions has a normalization and then it is an exponential minus half omega q square. Normalization I will not worry about because finally I will discuss in terms of relative normalization. So there is some normalization factor which is not taken into account. Then you are taking the product of a whole lot of exponentials. So that will be exponential of a whole lot of sum minus, what will it be the sum of, it will be the sum, the sum is going to be replaced by integral over dvk, so it is integral over dvk over 2 pi u over q, omega k, not 2 k. Let us make sure you understand that. Think of this d3k over 2 pi the whole cube as a, just a summation over k. Alright? So it's an exponential minus something summation over k. So that is equivalent to product <coughs> of individual exponential. What is the individual exponential? It is exponential half omega k qk square, which is this the ground state of that qk oscillator. At this stage, you can again go back and think of xk as yk plus xk plus i yk, and then both of them are taken together. So you are clear up to this. Okay. So this is what we have got. But it is not quite there because this is still in terms of QK. And what we would like to do is to write it down in terms of the field itself. Okay. Now when you do that, it is described in the handout, when you do that for a massive field, 
really mathematically you end up with some Hangul functions and things like that. So I will work with the massless field just to illustrate the point. Massless field turns out to be nice. So what we want to write is that the omega k q k square we want to express in terms of the field variable itself. And it's a trick for doing this. You first notice that for a massless field, omega k is just modulus of k. Right? I mean that is that is the simplification. Omega k square is k square plus m square, you throw away m square, so omega k is modulus of k. Then you write it as k square. Right? Okay, we can give you divided by modulus of k. As I said, it's purely a trick. Okay. Now you notice that this k, k, k square q k square is the Fourier transform of gradient of phi. That is, we had a phi expression there. So if I look at gradient of phi, that will be integral t3 t over 2 pi t over q. You take the gradient on this. So it will be i k q k at any given time. So time level doesn't matter. t to the i k <coughs> Right? So Inverting this Fourier transform, this into e to the minus i k dot x integral over g three x. This should be the gradient on x at x. This will be equal to this one. So I want to take two copies of it and multiply them together. Then on the right hand side, I take the complex conjugate and multiply them together. So if I take the complex conjugate and multiply them together, I will end up getting mod k square i and minus i will take care of themselves to give unity q k square. This is the right hand side. And that quantity will be given by two copies of this multiplied together. So I will have integral over d3x d3y one term and its complex quantity. So I have a del x phi del y phi e to the minus i k dot x minus 1. Right? So this is nice because this object which is sitting here I have expressed in terms of the fields. So you go and plug this into this. So you find that your psi ground state is given by n exponential minus half. So I am going to substitute for this this. So let me keep the x and y integrations first. So I have a d3x d3y phi x phi derivative at x dotted with yeah this is actually a dot because you have a gradient here and a vector here. We are taking a dot in order to get k square. Dot with uh, gradient evaluated at y. Then what is left? What is left here is just this quantity. So when I plug it in, I will have this. And then I will have a 1 by k there. So I will have an integral over d3 k upon to pi d4 q. e to the minus i k dot x minus 1 upon modulus This is just the Fourier transform of 1 by k. Okay? So you can work that out. It is essentially going to be, to be 1 upon modulus of x minus y equals 1. Because 1 by k is uh, 
1 by x Fourier transform is 1 by k square, so 1 by uh, k is Fourier transform will be 1 by x square. Okay, except for a constant which I think is 1 upon 4 pi square, but you can check that out. That is not very <coughs> So if I plug that in, I will end up getting this divided by modulus of x minus y equals square upon 4 pi square. I think the whole thing is 1 upon 4 pi square. So as I said, this, uh, this constant you fix is anyway there in the handle. Okay, but this is the important expression. Now this is a very nice result <coughs> because for once we have done a conus calculation and have found the wave functional <coughs> of a massless scalar field in its ground state. And this also tells you something very, very non -trivial. We are talking about a massless scalar field, which means its excitations are massless particles. And if you take a massless particle, you can write down the propagator for it to go from one point to another. And that is all there is to it for a free field field. Right? This is what we would have thought from our original path integral level. So you just give me the particle with some mass and I will construct for you the propagator. But this tells you something completely different. If you think of it as a field and give realities to the field, and you give reality, physical reality to the harmonic oscillators of which the field is made of, then even when there are absolutely no particles, there are no excitations, when the field is exactly at the ground state, you find that there is a non-zero probability to find non-zero field configuration. What does this mean? It means that suppose you give me a phi of x, as I gave you an example, e to the minus some uh, l square x square. Then you give me another field configuration which is e to the minus l square x square upon uh, x to the power 4. Okay? So you give me two different field configurations. And I want to know in the vacuum state, what is the relative probability for finding one field configuration or the other. So you take mod square of that and you compute the field configuration and you take the ratios. That is why the normalization does not matter. So when you compute it, you find a, you will find a non, you will find a result which is a number. So there is a non-zero amplitude and a relative probability for different field configurations to exist in the ground state. So this tells you that there is something to the field more than what is captured by the excitations or the particles. And that is probably the best way anyone can tell you because we have not understood anything more than that. I mean, you can put it in much more sophisticated language, but that is all we have understood. So, for most purposes, these two descriptions are equivalent, but there are some important conceptual issues where they are not equal. And as I said, eventually when we do things like um, what is known as an Andrew effect, which is where a vacuum state looks like a thermal state in another field, or Casimir effect, where boundary conditions imposed on the field becomes important, then the kind of excitations you study can also, the vacuum fluctuation, the pattern of vacuum can look different. And it can have observable which we will describe. So it is not something which you can just dismiss and throw it away. But at some level, this should not be surprising to you. Because we have said that the field is uh, decomposed into harmonic oscillators. So let us go back to the harmonic oscillator. This is your good old quantum mechanics 101 harmonic oscillator. Classically, if you put the particle here, that's it. The probability that you will find it somewhere else is zero. If you had a ground state which was a Dirac delta function, then you could have said that in that ground state also this holds. But we know that in quantum mechanics that cannot happen because the momentum will be infinite. Right? So the ground state in harmonic oscillator has some energy, half h cross omega. And the wave function which you are going to talk about is going to have a Gaussian shape like. So you can say in the ground state of the harmonic oscillator, what is the amplitude for the pendulum to be displaced by 3 centimeter? And that number is non zero Now here, in the classical ground state, field is zero, which is like this point. Okay? Then you ask, what is the amplitude, what is the probability amplitude for the field to have some displacement from the vacuum by some amount? This is just your Gaussian ground state e to the minus half omega q square written in terms of the field function. Okay. So this is how uh, wave functionals look. 
you can write down for example the first excited state for a, with the momentum k you can write down the expression it will get multiplied by something and then you can ask what is the amplitude for these things to propagate etc etc and you can actually do the whole thing in terms of this it can be done it's messy but it can be done as far as free field is concerned you can decompose everything into oscillators and work with okay but this is all which we will do as far as wave functionals are concerned in the next lecture i will do the actual quantum field theory using what is known as canonical quantization procedure and you will find that there also there are a few surprises which we will come in on except for that i will just go rapidly to mathematics so it will be a good idea if you come after revising what we did in the case of uh, propagator being represented in terms of harmonic oscillators and expectation values etc i'll i'll go through it very rapidly i will only do new things and the old things i'll just say that it has been done So the, in this case, the probability will peak when the field function is such that its gradient is vanished. Yes. So, uh, but that is that by itself doesn't mean much, in the sense that uh, I mean it is peak with respect to what? With respect to some other uh, some configuration. Other yeah. But it does not prefer any one value of the field. Phi is equal to 17 to phi is equal to 23. Right. So it is it is in some sense uh, that just goes out of the normalization. what it actually tells you is that if i change phi to phi plus a okay my grand state functional does not change that means that a constant shift to the field has no effect on the state it is only the gradient of the field which contributes to it see the way to think about this is that if you look at the hamiltonian for the field the hamiltonian has a phi square term which is like our p square term then in the harmonic oscillator you will have plus omega square q square here what you will have is gradient of phi dv square plus m square phi square in this particular case we have even set m square phi square to zero so i have only a gradient of phi dv square it is that what is sitting here okay essentially if you had kept m square it will be a more complicated mess but essentially you feel if you if the field is trying to go to the lowest energy state it has to be smooth because the gradient of phi every gradient contributes to the hamiltonian and uh, kicks up the energy so the field tries to have a constant value and that is its preferred state which is what is captured by saying that del phi equals 0 the probability is p i was just wondering that when we look at example electromagnetic field we normally think of it as a possible field right? electromagnetic field right. yes it is so, a possible yeah so the idea is that uh, why is it Is it that uh, the classical configurations that we are so familiar with? Right. They uh, like what? A electromagnetic wave, for example. If you are talking about source free. Maybe the electric field will be much better than some other kinds of things. Yeah. Plates or Almost all of them are coherent states. You can describe. So they are not in the ground state. They are not in the ground state. So what happens is that uh, you take exactly the same state and you shift Q K by some alpha K. The entire analysis goes. Through. Okay, and uh, instead of Q K, you will work with Q K minus alpha K, and the alpha K will be the Fourier transform of your classically given electromagnetic. So it is just like taking for every oscillator the coherent state and taking the multi product of that. Okay, and most of the classical configuration, like for example, you can show. I think it is there in uh, Dirac's principles of quantum mechanics, which people don't read. It is in the last chapter or somewhere. He actually shows in one of his this thing that even you have a, a system like a hydrogen atom, and the hydrogen atom goes from one state to another and emits the radiation. What happens to the in the semi-classical limit to the electromagnetic field state? He shows that it goes into a coherent. Okay. So the best description of many of the. Both those state limit there is just one more photon than something called the vacuum. Yeah, but if you want to study it in the semi-classical limit where there is a radiation. Oh. Okay, because that is what okay. I thought your question was. That the classical configurations which we know, of, which is generated by an oscillating charge or a dipole or whatever, almost all of them can be mapped to coherent states. Any other questions? Yeah. So the for massless nuclear field theory. That is correct. So for a massless nuclear field theory. Okay, I can tell you what will happen. All that will happen is that the maths will become more complicated. See, this will be still given by omega k, right? 
So what you have got is that is, uh, well, if you, suppose you are trying to follow the same analogy for a moment, which would be done by multiplying. This is a little silly way to do this, but you can. You can put a k square here and uh, k square here, right? And then you can play exactly the same game. This u k square k square can be transformed into this. So if you go through all of them, in the end, when you are doing the Fourier transform, you will end up be originally that omega k equals to k square. 1k, so it was 1 by k is Fourier transform. Now you will end up getting the Fourier transform of omega k divided by modulus of k e to the i k dot x minus 1. Yes. Okay. Let me call this some function of x minus 1. Instead, this one upon mod x minus y equal to square, you will replace it with this one. That's all. So, the, it turns out that this is a nastier integral than the other one to do. And it has to be regularized properly and all that. That is why I didn't go into that. You have to differentiate it with respect to m and calculate it. And it doesn't add anything illuminating to this, but it can be done. Uh, any physical recommendation for this? Any physical? Uh, uh, for this? Which one? The no, no, I don't understand. The ground state wave function has a simple physical interpretation. It gives you the probability amplitude for finding a field in the ground state. Whether it is massive or massless, the interpretation for psi gs doesn't change. Okay, its explicit form will change. That's all. There are some other questions. Yeah. So in the solar that Yeah. Yeah. We are just working with three particles kind of. Correct. We are not usually in short. Correct. So, just say a bunch of infinite particles in some potential here. Right. You can still work with this if you are ready to work with functional derivatives. Actually, not. The problem is it has to do with the relativistic invariance. I mean, this was this was mentioned long back when Gaurav once asked a question. That is, if you take a relativistic particle and you put the relativistic particle in a potential well, then can you describe the path integral by modifying them? Okay. It turns out that you cannot do that because if you take uh, theories which has to be Lorentz invariant, then the kind of interactions you can have for that is extremely limited. For example, you can play this game for electromagnetic field, but beyond that, or for any interaction which can be represented in a Lorentz invariant manner, you can't put an arbitrary potential in a relativistic field. This is exactly the same reason that if you take a relativistic, it has nothing to do with quantum field theory. If you take a relativistic particle, it's like an action is integral root 1 minus v square d. You cannot add to it a potential v of x and expect the theory to be relativistic. So this concept of a particle in a potential is a very non-relativistic concept. Yeah. Um, so, um, I would normally think of the classical a state which is also classical field to be something which is like uh, an eigenstate of the field operator, right? Because the field is what is that, kind of uh, Well, it is actually the eigenstate of the uh, annihilation operator. Also, that's what I'm not that is, the, just take annihilation. the coherent state. Take a harmonic oscillator coherent state. That can be interpreted in terms of annihilation and creation operators as an eigenstate. Okay? So, it is not an eigenstate of the field operator. Any more than coherent state is not an eigenstate of uh, field, I mean the Q operator. See, if you take a Q representation, then Q times psi is Q times psi, so in that sense it is always an eigenstate. That is not what we are talking about. No, sir, the sense in which I am asking is that suppose I want to say that I have a classical field, <coughs> what I mean is that if I measure the field, I get a different value. It's not a there are any fluctuations that I have the field. No, so what would be, no, so let me, let me translate it to a harmonic oscillator first. Ordinary non-relativistic harmonic oscillator. When you measure the position of the particle, suppose you want to always get a definite value for the position, then it is not the ground state of the harmonic oscillator, right? right? So what state are you talking about there? It will be a direct delta function, right? So that kind of a state is not the ground state is what I am trying to tell you. Right. Huh? Is that the same as the squared state? It's not even the squared state, right? In the case of harmonic Yeah, because the point is in the, in the state of harmonic oscillator, 
I misunderstood your question. If you want to get a definite value for Q, it has to be a Dirac delta function. Right. The wave function, the amplitude has to be a Dirac delta function. Correct? Therefore, it is. it will have at the next instant, it is going to have, you wouldn't even know where the particle is because the momentum is completely uncertain. So it is not even a nicely evolving state, it's a highly degenerate kind of state. Not degenerate, that is, uh, what would I say, it's a highly <coughs> regular kind of state. Okay? So we don't work in, in terms of those. I mean, it is one thing to have coordinate representation, where in some trivial sense, Q operator is a multiplicative operator, you take Q and multiply by any function, you get Q times that function. But that is not what we are talking about. 